Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Did the ancient Egyptians possess paranormal secrets? What is sacred dance? Can it open some kind of door for you into ancient wisdom? Well, hello and welcome to Behind the Paranormal. And this is the 164th edition of Behind the Paranormal. And that is 164 with a little TH above the 4. And this is Behind the Paranormal with ben, Paul and Ben Eno on our Monday Drive Time show on WOON 1240 AM and www.onworldwide.com. I'm Ben, and asking those unusual questions was my co-host and partner in the paranormal, my dad. But before we welcome tonight's guest and her unusual expertise, it's contest time. Oh, as always, we have our weekly contest. Last week's question was, which president of the United States supposedly signed a treaty with an alien race? And the answer is Dwight D. Eisenhower. Well, at least that's what some people believe. I have a little problem with that myself, but yeah, that's what some people believe. The treaty, supposedly signed in 1954 between the USA and a bunch of greys, commonly, you know, the little grey, they weren't green, were they? They were grey, supposedly. Yes. Uh, said that we'd stay out of each other's way, but that they could establish bases here and give us some kind of technology. Somehow that doesn't seem like staying out of each other's way. But anyway, you'd think the greys would have, uh, they would have had us on a reservation by now, but apparently not. Or the whole world's a giant reservation. Anyway, <laughs> Maybe. um... Amy Boyle from Boston was the winner. Congrats, Amy. Uh, this week's question is, what ghost supposedly haunts a riverbank in the town of Rio Frio, Texas? If you can deal with that, call us locally at 401-766-1240 or from anywhere in the U.S. at 800-449-1240. If I don't announce a winner during the show and you still think you have a shot, drop a line to me at bennettbehindtheparanormal.com. Uh, the winner will receive a copy of The Alchemy of Dance, Sacred Dance as a Path to the Universal Dancer. I love that title. That's by tonight's guest. Leslie Zare is the author of The Alchemy of Dance, Sacred Dance as a Path to the Universal Dancer. Originally from Peru, Leslie was raised in the USA, left Western culture in 1986 to immigrate to Egypt. She is one of their very few writers and teachers of esoteric wisdom who actually resides in Egypt. Leslie holds a degree in psychology from the Virginia Polytechnic Institute. And in Cairo, she continued her studies in alternative therapies and esoteric wisdom. Leslie holds international certifications in aromatherapy, touch for health and hypnotherapy, as well as diplomas in cla classical homeopathy and sand play therapy. I think you used to do in the sandbox. Uh -huh. And we'll have to find oh. out about that. Oh, you. She, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she is also a Reiki master. In 1995, Leslie opened one of the very first centers for health and wellness, uh, I should say health and well-being, in Egypt. She is Cairo's most prominent aromatherapist. In February 2006, she presented a lecture on aromatherapy at the National Research Center of Egypt. Leslie's shamanic work with plants has led her develop, to develop a line of Egyptian flower and sacred sites remedies called the Alchemia Remedies. I hope she'll correct me if that was wrong. A great many paranormal and goddess experiences have led to many of her current beliefs and methods. So, Leslie... Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but no, 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 no. I just uh, let me give her website. Let's see the website. Egyptianflowerremedies.com. Egyptianflowerremedies, one word, dot com. All right, so Leslie Zare, welcome to Behind the Paranormal. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. Oh, oh very good. Let me get my headset on here, Leslie. Very good. It's nice to have you. Okay, uh, I guess we're going to start uh, with a question from uh, Ben here, and uh, we'll start at the beginning. All right, so you often mention the term universal dancer. It's even in the title of your book. Uh, are you talking about God, or could you please elaborate on that point? Well, the universal dancer is actually the last card of the tarot. It's often called the universe or the world, and the tarot really... Is a, is a pictorial illustration of the, the alchemical or the enlightenment process. So really the universal dancer is that last point, that point that we're tr all trying to get to, the point of fusion. It's when we're one and dancing with the universe. It's the point of co-creation. So but basically what I'm doing is, the, or the work that I'm doing is, is all work to get us to that point. 
the dance is just one piece of that, but really that's the concept of the universal dancer, is that is getting to that, that point of fusion, that point of co-creation. I guess I'm a lousy salesman for my own book, but the, the, the Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny was my last one, and uh, I received a rare complimentary email from someone who liked it. Usually a lot of people just don't understand it, and, and a lot of the th- so, so you must be able to communicate better than I could this notion of, of total universal unity through things like dance, which is what I tried to do in that book. Um, maybe... See, I go back a lot of times to uh, ancient philosophy, a uh, very ancient philosophy, and the Greek idea that the creation kind of started with with musical tones and the dance and the whole frequency thing. Well, and, the center um, of every atom, there's just a vibration. That's true. Very, very yeah. center of it. Well, Leslie seems like she's really nailed it, and I think that's pretty cool. I just love the dance images you use. I think they're just glorious. Yeah, considering it's really, really hard to explain this stuff. You explain yes. it very well. <laughs> Thank you. You do. Yes, it is difficult to explain, and I swore I would never write a book for that reason because I felt it was very experiential, but then I think the book really backs up the whole concept. So that's... Yeah, that's I, I'm sorry to it. say we haven't had a chance to read it before we had John, but we, yeah. uh, oh, we're, we're going to. Well, what's interesting is there's some, like, Christian children's song that's like depicts Jesus as, like, Lord of the Dance and stuff. Oh, yeah, the Shaker, else. old Shaker hymn. Oh, yeah. You, you, you well, and your brother grew up with that. Yep. Yeah, and back to to what you're saying about explaining this concept of the universal dancer, I think that that's one of the advantages we have with the dance. This this sacred dance that I teach is an analogy. It's it's just following the music, which is really what co-creation is all about. You hear the music and you follow the call. So the, the dance is really an analogy, and I think unfortunately in our daily lives we really don't have enough opportunities or different ways to express or practice this this concept of co-creation this concept of surrender and allowing the music to go through you or following the music so i really think that the dance actually makes it easier because it makes it experiential Hmm. you can actually have the experience of surrendering to the music and then you know what it's like. You know what this this idea of co-creation is all about because you've actually done it. You've and done it on a very, you know, a very physical level. Mm-hmm. But still, I think we that's part of the problem is that when you're looking for this, when you're trying to understand co-creation, what does that really mean? Yeah, and that's true. So, yeah, to have the experience in any form, whether it would be dance, or I'm sure that someone could read that book and apply it probably to... Um, any kind of art, even cooking or anything like this, I'm sure that it would it would still be applicable. But for me, it came through with the dance. But I think that one of the important aspects of this dance is that it allows us to practice this and have a real experience of it. Yeah, without words getting in the way. Yeah, it's very yeah. it's very very interesting. Like the following the rhythm of things. I I get what you're saying. That's cool. I like yeah. that. Yeah. And really the universe is a vibration. It's moving in waves, and, and the four primordial movements that we use are all wave movements. We're trying to realign ourselves with the wave. Music moves in waves. So ultimately what we want is just to really pass the music through our body and, and respond to it. And again, I think that's another aspect of co-creation. If we allow the music to move through, Yes, it's my body, and I'm responding, but I'm responding to some guidance or some something that I'm hearing or feeling that's actually moving through me. Okay, now, now Ben and I wander in, a couple of guys off the street. We don't know anything about tarot, and we really don't, I don't know that much about it. I mean, 40 years in the paranormal, it just it doesn't cross my path that much, except because except people using it, but I don't really understand or astrology either. So we come in, and how, how do you translate that what you just said to a couple of people coming in off the street like us who don't know anything. Where do you begin? Well, I, I see these as vibrational archetypes, and, and this actually will lead us back to ancient Egypt because I believe that all of the archetypes or anything, when it's reduced, it's reduced to a vibration or an essence. Okay, well, let's, let's, let me just uh, explain. An archetype, at least my understanding, is, is a universal symbol that resonates with just about everybody on the planet, regardless yes. of their culture. Okay, yeah. a symbol. Okay. That's a, that's a good way. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, and, sorry. And, to and I would say something like Mother Earth is an archetype. Mm. And when we reduce it to its essence, it comes to a vibration, which is why 
every mythology, for example, has a Mother Earth archetype. It's named something different, but in its essence, it's the same thing. Now, what do you mean by a vibration? I mean, people are always using that word on this show, and I'm, uh, you know, maybe maybe I'm a little slow today, but <laughs> there are times I just I can't quite fathom what they mean. What, what do you mean by a vibration? Well, I know what I Ben just said, but... Well, I, I work with the elements, like in the dance, I work with the elements. The different movements are related to the four elements. So I see vibration or energy like fire, and then as we move through the densities, as things begin to get a little bit heavier, inspiration or energy moves to air, which is the mental realm. So I'm talking about that thing just before the mental realm, just before we name it Mother Earth, there's a vibration. There's a there's something that's even more essential than the concept, because as soon as we name it, we begin to limit it. So right, is, yeah. So this is what I. That's why I'm saying it's a vibration. It's something slightly higher than a mental image or a concept. So, so uh, okay, you're still losing me here. Is is it like a musical tone or or, or a wavelength? Or something. Well, yeah. how, how how do we perceive it? Yeah. How, how do we perceive this you this vibration with our? We, we feel it. Okay. Yes. Which is again like, um, well, my belief is it, it's connection to ancient Egypt. I I believe that all these vibrations occur, as I said, before they move to the mental level. They occur as a vibration. It's almost like the idea, or what's just right behind before you get the idea. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's very difficult to name. It's very difficult to name it because it is an essence. As oh. soon as we name it, we've moved it from that level, you know, from the energetic level into more of a mental concept. So, so it is so, difficult okay. to grasp. So, yeah. like an, in, an instant before the telephone rings, you, you, you kind of feel that it's going to ring. If you yeah. really watch yourself, that's what happens. Yeah. And okay. You're probably perceiving that vibration. Vib- okay, I got you. Yeah. All right, all right. I don't know if anybody yeah. else does. <laughs> It's um, not easy. No, it isn't easy. Okay, I hear, yeah, I can see so why it takes years of study. It's the mental level, so it's difficult to talk about concepts that are sort of yeah. pre-mental. Let know? me interrupt the conversation here for a minute. I want to welcome into the studio our good friend Dave Balfour. Dave, Dave uh, has a show on this station as well called Do You Remember? And he's also, uh, he works uh, with us in the areas of history and folklore. That's my other hat. And um, welcome to the show, Dave. Thank you very much. I good. didn't mean to interrupt. I just no, no, you're good. By, uh, as I told you the other night, I just dropped by for a quick visit. So, see, you're so important, Leslie, you get three co-hosts. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Leslie, I've been listening to your show. It sounds extremely interesting. Yeah, well, any questions you have, just, you know, uh, raise your hand. Okay. You know, and, uh, and though I'm not a nun, I'll call on you. All right. Okay. I have to say something, um, just make an observation here, uh, Leslie, that, that people might find very interesting. Uh, I spent 10 years in the seminary, and they don't deal with usually sacred dance or... <laughs> You know, well, sometimes they do, yeah. uh, or frequencies and this. But just, you know, looking at the totality of Christian tradition, there is a tradition of sacred dance. That, that it, and the Eastern Christian churches were very influenced by Egypt and by Egyptian yeah. spirituality, by Egyptian art. If you look at Orthodox icons, they're very yeah. uh, Egyptian-looking. Yeah, look at the Antiochians. Yeah, yeah, the the, uh, the Church of Antioch, they're, they're, they're very uh, much the same way. And I just think, think that, that the concept is just so so perfectly beautiful as you express it and it is present in uh, even even the christian tradition so one can imagine uh, how present it is in the egyptian tradition so okay so we're here we are a couple of guys coming in off the street as you say and you've started to uh, to communicate uh, very well what what you what you're doing now as far as you yourself where did you begin with this how did you end up in egypt well i ended up in egypt actually when i was nine years old i was Going, I had a passion for Egypt. That was just all I thought about. And interestingly enough, somewhere along the line, I lost that. And I went into science, and uh, I think I would have gone into Egyptology if I could have done it at that point. And I went into science, and then, as the universe would have it, I, I married an Egyptian man. I went to Egypt, and that was how I ended up in Egypt, which is where I think I should have been. So I guess... Um, he was the, the escort to take me there. So um, that's how I ended up in Egypt, and I've just stayed there all this time. And that and was 1986? Yeah. Okay. How have your, not to get political, but how have your ideas been received by the general Muslim population? Uh, I know that they have a certain 
awareness of this kind of thing. And certainly the Sufis yeah. use sacred dance, but they're considered heretics. <laughs> how, 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 do you, um, how do you deal with that? Well, or do you have to? No, I don't really have to because, first of all, the dance that we do, the, the sacred dance that I'm teaching, actually looks a lot like belly dancing. Oh, I hear you. Okay. So in the end, you know, that's what it evolved into. When the sacred aspect was removed, it became something slightly more profane or more performance-like, and it moved into belly dancing. But it's a very sim- the movements are very similar. So it's, it's present there. Oh, I and did read that part of your book. Yeah, well, I was able to read some of your book. Yeah. Uh, before the show. And you were discussing that, yeah. Okay. So that type of dance is there in that way. And I think that what's interesting is that most, the majority of my students are actually Egyptian women. Mm-hmm. So I always found that quite fascinating because I'm teaching this dance that the movements are pretty much something they've done all their lives, but they really want to know the other aspect of it. They want to know the deeper aspects of it. So it's been an interesting experience to um, to work with them, and 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 I'm flattered that they would come to me to to learn this because it really is something that's in the culture already. Okay. But as I said, it's slightly it's slightly different, or they don't know the deeper aspects. That's kind of been lost over time. All right. What, All right. Uh, that's so a good question. what is sac- what makes sacred dance? I should say, not what is. Well. It depends on which way you're looking at it. Very much it's about the intention that you're, that you're using when you do the dance. If you look at it from a more anthropological standpoint, in anthropology, anything that's sacred takes us back to the first time. So I think this type of dance actually covers both of those bases. But, so in anthropology, we're going to go back to the first time. And the first time is creation which is really what we're doing. When you do this dance, you are recreating the universe every time you do the dance. Mm -hmm. They are primordial movements. They're elemental movements. So it has that aspect of taking you back to something that is very primordial, um, just very essential, again, (laughs) my favorite word. But Mm -hmm. um, that is, I mean, that's how I look at things. I'm trying to, I, I take things back really to their essence. So we have that aspect of it in in the ancient sense that it is related to these these wave movements, which are very essential. It's related to you know the creation from the very beginning, and also we hold an intention. And I think the intentional part of it comes in a little bit more depending on what you're going to do with the dance. Okay. If you're going to do it for your own healing, mm-hmm. if you're going to do it as a meditation. So that also makes it sacred, but there are, then it has many different aspects of being sacred. It can be a healing dance. So there's there's many different ways that the sacred comes into it. Okay. But it's always about your intention to right. begin with, meaning that I intend to go back to something primordial or I intend to do it for healing or, or however you're going to manifest right. it. Uh, let me just remind people of our call-in number today. Uh, you're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WON 1240 AM in New England's beautiful Blackstone Valley. And uh, also online at www.onworldwide.com. Our call-in numbers today locally, 401-766-1240. And nationally, anywhere in the USA, 800-449-1240. And our guest is Leslie Zare expert on a number of very interesting things having to do with ancient Egypt, including aromatherapy and sacred dance. So, so in a sense, in a sense, Leslie, what you're describing is you're you're expressing the inexpressible. Yeah. Yeah. Without, we're very good. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's a very good way to put it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, you're bringing into form. You can you're use that. It's not copyrighted, but form. yeah. Okay. Good. Um, All right. So there seems to be a lot of astrology in your book. Why is that? Well, again, it takes us back to the archetype. Both both the tarot and astrology hold the same archetype. And these archetypes are a vibration. So if somebody were to do your natal chart, for example, what they're really telling you is which archetypes are vibrating inside of you, which is almost like your DNA. It's telling, you know, your DNA would tell you genetically what, um, what, what's vibrating inside of you. So um, it relates to the archetypes again. There's different ways to access this information. Some people use the tarot. I think they're used in slightly different ways, 
but really, again, you're, you, you're working with the archetypes and you're trying to access that information, either to see what's already present. Uh, the tarot, as I said, is really the alchemical process, so it, it really shows you this process in a pictorial form. But again, it's all related back to the archetype. So that's why I keep bringing in astrology and the tarot, because it's just different ways to express these archetypes or to access these archetypes. Okay. And uh, I wanted to get into how this translates now into practical remedies and health, which is supposed to be the point of the show, uh -huh. and even though we're halfway through. But first, uh, we always ask any sort of divination, you know, a sort of... Um, any kind of thing where you're asking somebody or something else what is going on, uh, which tarot can be considered a, a, a part of. We always ask the question, how do you know what you're getting is the truth? I know the usual answer is well, you're, not, you're not talking to anybody else, you're talking to yourself. So w what's your response to that? How, how do you know the information you're getting is, is uh, not a lie? Well, yeah, It's a major concern in our, our work sure. on the paranormal. And actually, that's a huge concern for me, which is why for a long time, I, I basically, the way I got into the dance, tarot, and astrology was all the same thing. It, it was an opening that I had during my Uranus opposition, which was back in 2002. And so when information started coming in, generally when I dance, I channel information. Well, that was fine for me, and I was doing the dance, but... I'm a kind of person that also, you know, I think I balance the left and the right brain, and I need some kind of confirmation as to to what's coming in. You know, this, this all sounds great, but how do I know that it's true? So I really set up the intention that in order to teach this to anybody else, I needed co external confirmation from somewhere. And what started happening was people would call me on the phone and say, you know, do you realize that this happens, whatever? And I would say, well, actually I do because I just had that experience. But they would actually give me the information or, you know, references to where I could go back and look things up. So for me, I think I made that part of my intention. Now, that's not exactly what you asked me. You asked me more about the tarot. But I think it's a feeling. For me, it's a feeling. Like I know when something is true. And I don't expect anybody else to believe me uh, if I just say, oh, no, I know that's true. But I think you need to go inside and you need to ask yourself, does this resonate with me? Does, is this true for me? If the information sounds true to you, then I think it is. And I, and I think that my lesson was almost that I needed to stop looking for external confirmation and trust more in what was coming in. But it does have a feeling. And over time, you get used to the feeling. You know when things are true and you know when they're not. Because you know when you're in alignment. You know when you're in the field. You know when you're in the right place and when you're not. Yeah, and I kind of agree with that. sometimes when you're not, you're only slightly off, too. Yeah. But you have to ask that question. Then your body has a way of telling you things. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, um, Ben, Dave, any questions? Okay. All right, well, well let's... Um, we could say more about that subject. Well, let's move on to, uh, I guess... We're going to take a commercial break. It's the bottom of the hour. So we'll be right back on Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno and our guest, Leslie Zier. Stay with us. New River Press is proud to sponsor tonight's segment of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Benjamin Eno. New River Press offers the best in unusual New Age books. Stand by the side of tonight's host, Paul Eno, as he battles poltergeists and helps suffering souls and families in the critically acclaimed books Faces at the Window and Footsteps in the Attic. Plunge deeper into the paranormal with Paul and learn about its influence on human history, its action in our daily lives, and its ultimate meaning for us in the best-selling Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny. Available now from New River Press, publishers of unusual books. Visit NewRiverPress.com, Amazon.com, or your favorite bookstore. And set for release late this year in one of the most unusual books on the subject ever written, Paul gives us Dancing Past the Graveyard, What Ghosts Have to Say About God. And that last book is coming someday. I just haven't had a chance to finish it. I seem to be able to cough out a book about every five years. Uh, Leslie, I hope you're quicker. Anyway, we're back behind the paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WON 1240 AM and ONWorldwide.com. And our guest today is Leslie Zare, uh, expert in aromatherapy and many, many other things that are very interesting, having to do particularly with Egypt. 
So, uh, all right, let's, let, let's get down to some uh, brass tacks here on, on remedies. And uh, how do you go from what we've been talking about in the first half hour, uh, you know, tarot and, and uh, the sacred dance and, and becoming aware of this, the vibrations? And I mean, how do you go from that to practical remedies that the ancient Egyptians used? Well, the remedies that I've made, I think the connection is that, again, we're moving back to a vibration. When you use remedies, whether they're flower remedies or sacred sites or homeopathic remedies, you're basically capturing energy in a matrix of water. So that's what I've done with these alchemia remedies is that I've captured both flowers and sacred sites in this medium of water. And flower remedies in general, flowers are our teachers. So when we work with any kind of energetic remedy, it's for a healing process. And this energy is in some way balancing or correcting or modifying or resolving the energy within our own body. So that's really, again, most of the work I do is, is on this very essential level. So with the remedies, it's that these remedies actually hold a vibration. They hold a vibration of Egypt in general because the flowers were grown there. And then they also hold the vibration of the flower itself. And there are two sacred site remedies. So they hold the vibration of that actual sacred site. The last one was made during the Venus transit at the Temple of the Sun, the altar on the Temple of the, the Sun. And um, so it's also holding that energy of the Venus transit. All right, that I might ask you to explain. But, uh, well, I'm thinking in terms of, uh, you, know, grass, you know, grassroots practicality here. Now, ben and his mom both have allergies. Okay. And um, at our age, uh, my wife and I are uh, creaking around the dance floor are not the uh, not the prettiest picture. But what, what, how do we translate sacred dance and, and herbalism, whatever, into uh, say Ben not being able to sleep in his room some nights because of the? Well, I think first of all, the remedies, the alchemia remedies, are really working again on a spiritual level. Mm-hmm. Now we know anybody who's doing metaphysics or working in any kind of healing, you know that when we heal something on the energetic level, then it doesn't need to come into the physical level. Or if we don't heal something on the energetic level, then again, it goes through these densities, and it first goes to the mental level, and then the emotional level, and then ultimately the physical level. So if we can heal things on the energetic level, we don't have to work with physical ailments because we've already resolved it. Hmm. When I work with the remedies, the alchemia remedies, I'm not working on physical issues. If somebody comes and says, for example, they're, they're not sleeping, uh, I would say, well, I would explain that this is, we're working on these, these other levels. If we can resolve those issues, yes, it will move into the physical level. But I've had people that came that wanted to stop smoking or something, and I said, it may help you to do that, but that's not what we're looking at. That's not where we're going in. We need to go out and see what issues you're actually dealing with on a higher level, resolve those, and then hopefully all of the physical ailments can just disappear because, again, disease comes to, to teach us something. Oh, I and hear you. So, in other words, if you set the vibration right, it doesn't translate into a physical ailment, exactly. so you don't have to heal it. Yeah. It's when, it's when we don't get it. You know, physical issues are usually when we kind of need a slap in the face. It, it got heavy enough that we didn't see it. And, and sometimes you don't. It's not, it's not that you're missing something. Sometimes you can't really get it until, you know, it moves into some part of your body. And this is like the healing power of illness and all these books that are written about the, the body-mind connection. So when we have an ailment somewhere in our body, we can look at where, what organ, or what part of the body it's in, and then we know what the issue is. If it's the liver, it's related to anger. You know, if it's the blood, it's related to the life force. So we can look at those things and translate them back and begin to understand what the, the real issue is. And this is why you need, to, you need to go back to that vibrational level, and that's really where you need to do the healing, which is what hands-on healing does or homeopathy or any of these energetic ways of healing because we want to get to the cause of the issue. 
Now, does, that now, work, does that work with cancer and things that are extremely serious and life-threatening? Yes, and, and cancer we know, and even a regular allopathic doctor will acknowledge that cancer is a personality type. So that means it's starting on that energetic level first. The father of Samuel Hahnemann, who is the father of homeopathy, talked about miasm. And miasm basically, and he was talking about this, you know, hundreds of years ago, that miasms are really like a genetic something we're passing on, but on a vibrational level. This was before we knew anything about genes. He was talking about miasm. So we pass these things on, and that's, in my opinion, what's really beneficial about the alchemia remedies is that they deal with these very ancient issues. They deal with these miasms that go through families, that go back through generations, so that we can really heal on all levels. And ultimately, that's what the Mayan calendar is talking about, is that on the seventh day, we will be completely, we will be evolving on all levels at the same time. We'll be evolving through our history and, and the present and all of it at the same time. We'll be activating all of this. That's an interesting observation. So uh, we're not limiting ourselves to ancient Egypt here. Uh, th- and this is something I've learned in traveling, is that is that all the ancient peoples pretty much knew all these basic things. Yeah. You know, about ourselves. You yeah. Know. So if, if uh, Ben or I went to the, or Dave went to the um, ancient Egyptian doctor, he or she would not necessarily hand us a medicine? No. But, okay. What, what, what would happen? Not, uh, that's very limiting. Again, you know, all of this, things being reduced only to the physical level really came through time as we became so focused on the physical. You know, when we lost, when we disconnected, when we became only interested in the material, whether it's money or physical, it, it, we moved away from that, that lighter, subtle realm or in seeing the importance of that, and we moved to this strictly physical one. Most modern medicine is dealing on the physical level, but we know that if you don't, it's not curative. If you don't resolve the issue, it's going to just keep coming back. So I think any type of holistic health which is what the ancients did. I mean, they did, They were never going, and probably they actually hardly ever looked at the physical realm. I would expect that they would mainly start with the more spiritual, um, because that's just where they were focused, was more on that spiritual realm, and feel that there must be something out of alignment on that level that is causing everything else to be out of alignment. Boy, talk about everything being out of alignment. We look at society today as we've inherited it and or built on it and we have a, a drunkenness with technology we have a complete you know duh when it comes to everything you've yeah. said pretty much how do you begin to deal with people who come out of the of this ethos today i mean it's just we're, we're, we're like i mean neanderthals are more advanced than we were spiritually probably I mean, how do you begin to deal with people who come out of this society well i think because it comes to a critical mass you know, that's what getting sick is all about. Yeah. That's when it becomes completely physical and your life is threatened, then I think you suddenly say, wait a minute, I better get things in alignment because, and it's unfortunate that it has to come to that point, but I think it has. Um, and hopefully with the availability or the increased awareness about different things, that, or, you know, and different things being available, more spiritual things or more spiritual practices, uh, and that's why I think the dance is a good thing, because most women love to dance. So they can do that, and they can have a great time doing it, and at the same time they benefit on the spiritual level, and I think it opens a door for them. You so just I le- think there's many ways in. Okay, you just led into a, a rather beautiful uh, aspect of this that I, always strikes me, and that's when I um, was uh, writing Turning Home, I, I put in some stories I'd heard from friends in Egypt about women uh, who are Muslims who go to, and this is, I think it's at Dendera, um, at the temple there, and they, they go to an image of Hathor, and they leave, as I understand it, offerings of vegetables and fruits in hopes of having children, because uh, well, yeah. it was Isis was known as the mother of all children, and is known as the mother of all children. And uh, I, I just think, and they, they, they'll say, well, I don't know who she is, but she's a good lady. And because uh, oftentimes, you know, if they don't have babies, they're in trouble. 
and uh, they see very often at worship. And I just think that is a, a beautiful expression of universal human love for the mother, and uh, and that seems to enter into your work as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it the return does, of the goddess, as it were. Well, and honestly, personally, I believe that's why I needed to go to Egypt. I needed to reclaim my femininity, and that's how I did it. Mm-hmm. I went to a place. Egypt is very polar. It's very masculine and it's very feminine. Mm. You have the lush Nile Valley and you have the desert. You have these two extremes and it comes up with everything. But I really think that for me, that's where I needed to go to see this, to live in a society um, that, that is matriarchal. I mean, it looks patriarchal, which it should, because the masculine is the external. But it's the women that, that run everything, you know, and everybody there, the men know that. <laughs> yeah, we know it at our house. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so for me, I really think that I needed to do that. I needed to leave Western society, and I needed to go someplace where I could embrace that aspect of myself. And my my attunement or my initiation was in Dendara Temple. And Hathor is, she's the goddess. She's the cow goddess. She's the, the sacred cow. And she is about fertility and birthing. And for me, I really feel that I was rebirthed when I went to Egypt because I was allowed to embrace these aspects of myself, and it is very socially acceptable. So it was just easy to do that. Very good. Okay. So uh, how did you get just – I know we're kind of backtracking, but how did you get – the journey from Peru to here to Egypt must have been an, a real odyssey for you. Well, I left Peru when I was quite young. I was five years old. So I've lived most of, I mean, my at least the years through school, I was in the United States. But I think it is my journey. And I see that, again, talking about vibration, I remember things from my childhood that are feelings. They're not concrete, um, you know, images or thoughts because I was very young. But when I went back to Egypt, I felt that I had gone home. And I think a lot of that was that connection with that, that feeling. Peru is also a very ancient culture. I think that's just my calling is to live in ancient cultures. And the vibration is very different. If you go to Egypt, the minute you get off the plane, it just feels different. And for me, I have trouble when I come back to the United States because it, it feels different for me. And yeah. it's not, and I don't think it's the vibration that is really... Um, for me, a very creative one. I mean, for me personally, a very creative one. I feel much more creative or expansive when I'm in Egypt. So for me, that's the place that I should be. Hmm. Okay. Do you feel that people today are becoming uh, more aware of this level of living that you're describing rather than just the, you know, climb out of bed, crawl into the car, go to work, and say maybe, you know, <laughs> the, the, the entirely physical to. aspect? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the economic crash, that's what it was all about, was to make everybody realize that really? okay. money is one thing and there are other things. And, and maybe the only way to really realize it is to not have it, you know. Yeah. And, to, and there were many people. I mean, I watch, we get a lot of programs from the United States and Egypt and watching programs like Oprah where people would say, you know, um, it was the best thing that ever happened to them. It brought their family back together. And in Western society, I think people have become, you know, obsessed with technology, as you were saying, and it separated people. It makes them into their gadgets or whatever instead of this sense of community. And so I think that, you know, when when something drastic happens, you have to find people to help you or people to connect with. So it probably is a blessing in disguise. Yeah, that's a very good way to look at it. And you did mention the Mayan calendar, and we I don't know why I think of 2012, and Ben doesn't either, I guess. What? Well, <laughs> we're talking about 20, 2012, I wanted to ask. <laughs> No, you, you, were, you were just sort of like, blah, 2012, and I was like, wait, what? I'm sorry. Well, I didn't mean to uh, you know, confuse you. No, uh, but, but uh, Leslie brought up the Mayan calendar. I was going to ask uh, what her particular opinion is on that. I mean, I don't know, there, because we get questions about it all the time. In a way, I'm sick of the subject, but people are concerned about it. Yeah. So what, what do you think, Well, Leslie? I think there's two things going on. I mean, I, I had, in fact, the, the friend of mine, that the dean of consciousness studies at the International Metaphysical University, she's the one that asked me to do the remedies course, and she's the one that introduced me to the Mayan calendar. 
And I was introduced through Carl Kalaman's work and Ian Mungle's work, and which I think is, you know, is, very, is much more spiritual and probably closer. Uh, the, the Mayan calendar is a calendar of the evolution of consciousness, and that's what I see, that, that that's, where, that's what it's showing us. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not, you know, convinced about all the doomsday things, although we are moving into a period of solar flares. So we don't know what's going to happen. So those two things may coincide, but I don't think they're the same thing. I, I see the Mayan calendar as being, well, it is the one we're talking about, is the spiritual calendar, and it's been very accurate. And I think we are evolving, our consciousness is evolving just the way that, you know, that they said that it would. And it apparently comes from this galactic center, which is, you know, there's this this um, beam of information again that's coming from there, and I think it is very accurate. Well, and no doubt, is, you know, a lot of a- weird astronomical things are happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And but I don't, that, I don't believe that's what the calendar's talking about. I think there's, those are two separate things. And if we look at the Mayan calendar, what they're talking about is something very spiritual, mm-hmm. and the evolution of consciousness. And and the Mayan calendar predicted this economic crash, you know, in the yeah. fifth day. And I think it is, again, all those are small elements that are taking us to this bigger place. So I think we are on the path of, of this evolution. And so that's how I look at the Mayan calendar. I think it's in alignment with the universal dancer. But I'm looking at that aspect of it. I'm not looking at... I, I also believe that even if these things do happen, you know, because of solar flares or whatever Earth changes, if we are evolved, it isn't going to make any difference. And this is what the Mayan calendar also says. We're given the skills we need to deal with the next period of time that we move into. Mm-hmm. So even if these, these drastic earth changes come, if we've evolved, I think we're going to be very much attuned to where we should and shouldn't be. You know, if you're, if you're attuned to animals, for example, they're attuned to the earth and earthquakes. And, you know, apparently during the tsunami, they all ran away before it happened. So, you know, if we can reach that level of intuitiveness, then I think we'll be safe and we'll be able to deal with anything that comes our way. Okay. Well, I think that's a very reasonable approach and I hope you're right. Well, tell us about uh, your book and also what you're teaching at uh, International Metaphysical University. And Where can people get your book? Um, it's available on Amazon mm-hmm. and also I have a, another website. You mentioned the Egyptian Flower Remedies website. I have another website called The Universal Dancer. Okay. It's just universaldancer.com. All right. And um, there are links there for the book, but it is available through um, Barnes and Noble and, and Amazon and iUniverse. Um, okay. Uh, and the, the other book is The Alchemy of Dance, Sacred Dance as a Path to the Universal Dancer. Well, that's what it is. Okay, and uh, we're, we're, but we both teach at International Metaphysical University, although this is the first time I've met you, so to speak. Uh, tell us about what you're teaching there. Well, I'm teaching a course on the alchemia remedies, mm-hmm. and it is a practitioner's training course. So basically I'm teaching you how to work with the remedies, why you would want to work with the remedies, what, you know, what the benefits are. And, um, yeah, so there's two kind of main branches to my work, the sacred dance and the remedies. And okay. so the course is, is about the remedies, and as I said, it's a practitioner's course on how to use the remedies and I think it works well with other modalities. It, it is for people who are already doing some kind of spiritual or healing work, and I think it, it works well with, with other things. It is about really doing that deeper work. So uh, I, think it's, I think it's something that's very necessary at this point in time because we were talking about every, all the changes that are going on, and, and I think we need to work at that level. We need need to really go in there and do the deep work at this point in time. Okay. All right. Well, Leslie, uh, we're coming down to the end of our interview here. I wanted to thank you so much uh, for being with us. It is extremely interesting, very unusual subject for our show. Oh, yeah. And um, we'll be in touch, and very, very good luck to you uh, in all your endeavors. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very for much. for having me on. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right. All right. I'm sorry. Either your fellows had questions. Um, okay. Well, it's too late now. Well, isn't it? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ben, I'm a lot older than you. Are you going to keep me on the straight and narrow? It's it's whatever. I didn't have any questions. I was just messing with you. Okay. 
messing with me. Okay. Yes. All right, we have some, uh, some interesting emails here and some interesting reports from the South Pacific on some um, interesting goings on. First, I want to read this one. Actually, this is addressed to you. It's addressed to me? Yes, imagine. Oh, oh. I guess people, when they don't want to talk to me, they have an alternative. Oh, I get yeah, yeah, because they, I don't know, because I, whatever. Um, I, I read your article on the possible connection, oh, no, I read, sorry, I yeah. read your article on the possible connection between mental health symptoms in some people and the paranormal. I am a mental health provider, and it says in parentheses, um, MSW, at the Virginia, at the VA in Cheyenne. I don't Cheyenne, Wyoming, I guess. Yes. Yeah. I love to study quantum uh, psychology based on quantum physics and find it the key to the correlations I, and obviously you, seek between mental health symptoms and the alternative paranormal explanation. The problem is once you bring the paranormal into the mix, people tend to shy away from such inquiry. Could you recommend anyone else who may have explored this connection so that... I may further my study and theory and have additional backup research. Thank you for your time. Okay, this is from Jean Wheeler is her name. It doesn't say exactly where she lives, but presumably I'm, it's in Wyoming. I'm pretty sure this was addressed to you, and they just put it to me because they figured your email would be filled. Oh, well, sometimes it, that's all right. No, that's, well, uh, well, you have insights on that sort of thing, too. Well, because, you know, I know a lot of people that are into that subject. Well... Ah, uh, yeah. I, I unfortunately do not. I, 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 was, answer, I was being, I was, I was being facetious. I, I see. Yes, uh, you occasionally do that. Yes, as do I. Yes. Uh, but anyway, uh, for Jean, I, I, there are not a lot, uh, not a lot of work has been done on that subject, and I've been, except I suppose on a on a lower level by me, I haven't got well, the closest a medical thing, degree. Closest thing we have is that show we had a couple of weeks ago with uh, Doctor Luke. Yes. That's pretty much the closest you'll get, but yeah, he was. He, we were discussing a parapsychopharmacology. I defy you to spell it, uh, but he is the probably the world's leading expert on it. The University of Cambridge in England, and, and uh, even he was mentioning that there are certain roadblocks that still exist. Now, yeah. now back when I started this, if nobody wanted to hear it, and I was working in psychiatric hospitals as a seminary student and as a grad student, and only in closed, darkened closets. Would mental health professionals even discuss the paranormal? And they knew that's what I was doing there, and I was working with a priest, uh, who ostensibly was the chaplain there, but also was the, one of the greatest experts on exorcism at the time as well. This is in the 1970s. So to this day, there is still a certain amount of reticence among these people. I've addressed groups of psychiatrists on this subject and brought up the idea that the paranormal may be intertwined, almost certainly is intertwined with some cases, of what is uh, generally interpreted as psychoses. But they, they uh, the steam comes out of the ears and the eyes turn red. But in the end, when they talk to you privately, they'll say, "I, I have, su- I have suggested perhaps, uh, you know, or have suspected rather the same thing." But I lose my job if I say it. So I, I, there just isn't much work being done in this field. Uh, I'm doing what I can, but again, I haven't. I, I have the wrong. I've been told I have the wrong academic degrees. But you know, one does what one can. I mean. Uh, Edison invented the light bulb with three months of formal education, so I don't know. So I'm afraid I can't be very positive on this for you, Gene. Uh, I, if, if I do run into anyone who is working on, on the paranormal slash psychiatric field, I will let you know. All right. Now, we have uh, some interesting uh, reports here from the South Pacific. Uh, some of them go back as far as World War II. This has to do with the phenomenon uh, which uh, generally is interpreted as being flying monsters or pterosaurs of the paranormal, I should say, of the prehistoric variety. And uh, this is um, in the, <laughs> the producer's looking at me. Uh, they are known in Papua New Guinea as the Ropen, or it translates demon flyer. Uh, it is a monstrous creature that's terrified the natives of Papua New Guinea, supposedly, for thousands of years. Another smaller creature, the Dua, possibly related to the Ropen, uh, haunts some of the far-flung outlying islands. Uh, now this is our little bit of a lead into our CBS show next Sunday, which is going to be um, on this subject. On, on this subject with Nick Redfern, uh, very well known, generally known as a UFO researcher, but also why, a why am I never consulted on these things? Well, you don't like Nick? Well, 
I do, but I just didn't know this, that that was the topic of next week's show. Your dad likes to surprise you. Oh, it's just like a birthday every day. <laughs> That's right, every, every week anyway. No presents, though. Oh. Uh, I'll give you a model of the pterosaur. No, I'm, I'm fine. Anyway, there are all kinds of sensational eyewitness reports collected by determined exploration. And to this day, it's not easy to, to explore some of these places. You're talking about Pacific Islands with uh, you know terrifying snakes and jungles and all this. It's, it's like still Jurassic like, Park. Yeah, it's still there, very much like Jurassic Park. But anyway, some people have been penetrating in their researches and have led uh, serious people uh, to the conclusion that the two distinct animals really do exist, this Ropen and this Rua, right? The description of both of these flying creatures uh, match that of the fabled pterosaurs, okay, ferocious flying dinosaurs thought to be extinct for 65 million years. Now, uh, two of these fellows are Jim Bloom and David Wetzel. Uh, they are two of the fellows who have kind of uh, spent a lot of time and uh, taken their lives in their hands by exploring some of these dangerous areas and some of the outlying islands where some of these monsters supposedly live. And not only uh, have these two fellows compiled eyewitness accounts of the creatures from frightened natives, uh, physical evidence of gigantic nesting sites in some of the mountainous cliff areas, uh, both men have personally witnessed the soaring creatures themselves. And Wetzel claims that he even shot some uh, video footage. And uh, we do not have that, I'm afraid, on our website right now. But there is or on one the, or on the paper uh, right there. Well, there is one, on the, but it's too small to be seen. I think we'll probably have to. When we get to Nick uh, Redfern, we'll put uh, this up on the behind the paranormal website yeah, yeah. on our talking points page, so people can see them. Uh, Western missionaries, World War II. We're talking about this. Uh, we also had um, the uh, reports from Japanese soldiers. Of this, and it, this harks back to some of the Godzilla movies, maybe, but the Japanese yeah. soldiers were supposedly fighting, and, and some of the naval <laughs> vessels uh, had their hands full with the Allies, as it was, but they were also firing at these yeah. flying mon- monsters. And supposedly, uh, in New Guinea, uh, one of the islands, they shelled the caves and the nests where these things supposedly were living. So uh, these guys um, in the Japanese army had uh, a little more going on than fighting the U.S. Marines at the time. Uh, it's so was, funny. Like it's well, you wouldn't have thought you were funny. I know, were, uh, but like it's just like they're fighting the Americans and the dinosaurs. It's yeah, talk about trouble. Well, anyway, you had there, there, there is a, a surviving uh, Japanese uh, soldier who is very old who, who uh, actually has reported on this uh, that he was involved in uh, the shooting at some of these flying creatures. Uh, wounding one and going with his his uh, unit up to the cave and fighting the things in the cave. I mean, uh, maybe talk that's about where they got movie. like the legend of like Rodan or something. Yeah, Rodan or Mothra or somebody. Yeah, we, yeah, we're know, pretty good. We're pretty up on our like, Japanese monsters. Except those were like little larva things and like well, they're not little. They were in little mine caverns. But yeah. anyway, back to this. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so this is this is what the reports are. And so as uh, people penetrate more into these jungle areas, whether it be Africa or uh, the South Pacific, these uh, reports are um, are coming well, out. Yeah, they've been untouched by our society. That's it. Maybe well, if most of our society wasn't untouched, we'd have all these things. That's it. Well, we got less than two minutes left, so we're going to close. But uh, anyway, that's a bit of a teaser for our CBS show on Sunday. That's and we'll give cool. us more details on that. It's going to be uh, very interesting with Nick Redfern, Adventures of a Monster Hunter. Okay. All right. So, again, we refer you to BehindTheParanormal.com, our website. You can find out about our guests, past and uh, upcoming. Also, uh, get over 200 podcasts of different shows that that we have have done on various uh, stations and networks. And many, many thanks to our uh, good producer, the great Dave Richards himself. And we'll see you right here next Monday, August 23rd. W O O N twelve forty a.m. O N Worldwide dot com, six p.m. Eastern, three Pacific. Our guest will be, I don't know. We uh, didn't. Anyway, it'll be a surprise. Someone great. Check the website. Yeah. Okay. And we're uh, we're done. So say goodbye, Ben. All right. See you next week. New River Press is proud to sponsor tonight's segment of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Benjamin Eno. New River Press offers the best in unusual New Age books. Stand by the side of tonight's host, Paul Eno, as he battles poltergeists and helps suffering souls and families in the critically acclaimed books Faces at the Window and Footsteps in the Attic. Plunge deeper into the paranormal with Paul and learn about his influence on human history, its action in our daily lives, and its ultimate meaning for us in the best-selling Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny. 
Available now from New River Press, publishers of unusual books. Visit NewRiverPress.com, Amazon.com, or your favorite bookstore. And set for release late this year in one of the most unusual books on the subject ever written, Paul gives us Dancing Past the Graveyard, What Ghosts Have to Say About God. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.